So in the last year, I've written two books, and um, I don't recommend that. That's not good on your health. But uh, ironically, yes, people who write health books can get unhealthy a little bit in the process. <laughs> but hopefully, uh, how many have gotten either cholesterol or keto clarity? Raise your hand. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think we had 100 copies of keto clarity. We sold out before lunch. They're gone. They're all gone. So thank you. So I'm gonna go very quickly through the cholesterol information so I can get to the keto, but I thought the cholesterol was really important information that you need to know about because we've gotten some really fundamental things wrong about cholesterol, and I'm gonna talk about 12 of them. So yeah, that was me at 410 pounds, 185 kilo back in 2004. And after I lost my weight, I went to my doctor and I said, uh, how you like the weight loss? Well, of course, he was so happy about that. But then he said, so how'd you do it? Uh-oh, Atkins, and he said, let's check your cholesterol. And I went, oh great, okay, here we go. So I'm like, I have nothing to hide, my cholesterol's fine. So he gets the numbers and he runs them and my triglycerides come back at 43 in American terms, which is really good. Uh, help me out, is that under, help me out, Ken. 0.5, good, that's really, really good. And the doctor's like, uh, or I said, isn't that great? Now, oh yeah, that's really great. That's some of the lowest triglycerides I've ever seen. But you need a balanced statin drug. <laughs> what? So then we looked at the HDL and it came back at 70. Help me out there. So like 1.4 or 5, really good level. And he said, he said, that's really good, but you need to be on a statin. I'm shaking my head because all he was looking at was total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. And as you've heard from previous talks from people like Ken Sakaris, that's the old thinking. That's what, 30 years ago thinking. So I did decide at that point, somebody needs to tell this cholesterol story because we've got it all wrong. So that's why I wrote Cholesterol Clarity. It came out last year and uh, it actually ended up being the number two paleo book of the year according to paleo magazine readers just behind Mark Sisson's book. So I was, uh, Mark can have number one. I'll take number two. So thank you. So sky high cholesterol, that's what we focus on. So let's take a look at that. The number one thing we've gotten wrong about cholesterol is we think LDLC and total cholesterol matter the most. And you've probably been to your doctor and that's what he looks at. My doctor, that's exactly what he looked at. Total cholesterol, which in your terms, I did, I did run this one so I'd know it's 5.0. That's kind of considered the normal. Anything over 5.0 is considered abnormal. Anything under 5.0, you're good. Well, that doesn't tell the whole picture because there are some good things about your total cholesterol and there are some bad things about your total cholesterol. So just looking at total cholesterol by itself is kind of nonsensical. And then LDL, you see it has a dash C after it. Ha have anybody ever, ever run your cholesterol and you see LDLC? No? Yeah? All right, come on. I know you just had lunch. So yeah, it's a calculated number. Did you know that? That it's not an exactly measured number that they have to run it through this thing called the Friedwald equation to come up with your LDL. And yet they're giving us limitations on LDL. And if you don't have that limitation, then you need to be on a drug. It doesn't make any sense at all. So that's the first thing we got wrong about cholesterol. Number two, all but ignoring uh, HDLC and triglyceride levels. So HDL, the goal should be 1.8 or above, and triglycerides 1.8 or below. Do you have a doctor that tells you this? Not really, it's just not happening. Number three is failing to understand the varying LDL subparticles, and we're very um, lucky in America we can run these subparticle tests, but if you have those cholesterol levels like we were just talking about with HDL over 1.8, and the triglycerides under 1.8, you're probably gonna have mostly 
those large fluffy kind of LDL particles. The problem that comes into play is the very small, dense, BB-sized LDL particles, and those are indicative of a high-carb diet with very high triglycerides and very low HDL cholesterol. But doctors aren't talking about subparticles, and they should be. Number four, they assume the 2.5 LDLC or 5.0 total cholesterol uh, go going over those needs a statin. I'm sorry, they don't have a statin deficiency. It just does not exist in the human body. And yet these are being prescribed like Tic Tacs. Do you guys have Tic Tacs in Australia? Okay, good. Just wanna make sure that analogy worked. So. Yeah, and they're putting people on these statins. Now, that's not to say there aren't some people that might benefit from statins, but it may not be the cholesterol-lowering effects that's causing the benefit. It may be the inflammation-lowering, which we'll talk about later when I talk about keto clarity. Number five, here's the thing we got dead wrong about cholesterol. Saying low-fat, low-cholesterol diets are heart-healthy. You ever been to your doctor and he's, uh, he says, oh, your cholesterol numbers are horrible. You need to eat a low fat, high healthy whole grains diet, right? Uh, if only those worked. They don't work. They might, and one thing that low fat diets do very well is they do lower your LDL cholesterol, but it tends to be at the expense of some of the other markers on your panel. Number six thing we got wrong, speaking of where we got things very wrong, underestimating the effect of carbs and vegetable oils. And cholesterol clarity, we talk about these being the twin villains in your health. Um, carbohydrates, I mean, they raise inflammation like a champ. Most of those carbs on the screen are just not very healthy for you at all. And don't get me started on vegetable oils. What an atrocious product we have unleashed on the food supply. And then you guys have the little what, Australian heart tick symbol. And we have our obnoxious American Heart Association heart healthy symbol. They're lying to people because it's not at all healthy for your heart. Now what those things do, they do lower LDL cholesterol like a champ, but they raise your inflammation levels. And in the end, that makes your heart health much worse, not better. Number seven, we believe low cholesterol levels are the optimal state. And uh, you ask most people, what's the perfect level of cholesterol? Well, uh, zero. You would have people that would actually say zero because they think it's all about as little as possible. That's a problem. Number eight, automatically assuming that high cholesterol is genetic and in the midst of writing cholesterol clarity, I actually ran the genetic tests for my cholesterol, which has always been high, and it came back a 5% chance that I had FH, which means 95% chance I probably do not have this uh, genetic cholesterol thing. And yet when I get my cholesterol run, it still has that little saying, uh, patient could show signs of familial hypercholesterolemia, and I'm like, no, I ran the $1,800 lab that says I don't. So it's, it's pretty interesting. And there's a lot of reasons why cholesterol can be up. I'm just going to tell one story I wasn't going to tell, but this is really good. Um, my cholesterol came in really high uh, during the writing of Cholesterol Clarity, and I had some teeth work done. So I had uh, some mercury amalgams removed. I had some root canals where they cleaned up the um, infections that were in there. And I just had them run again. And in American terms, the numbers dropped triple digits. It's huge. So it went from something like almost 400 total cholesterol to now 289. I've not seen a two in front of my cholesterol number in almost a decade because those infections, and yet how many doctors are asking why you have high cholesterol rather than just you know, giving you the statin drug, why don't they ask, hey, do you have any like dental infections that might need to be taken care of or mercury or other things? We talk about a whole slew of things that can raise your cholesterol and cholesterol clarity, but that's one and a big one. Number nine, doctors don't have a clue when it comes to cholesterol levels and why they're high, like we were just talking about. They just don't know about all these little effects. 
And part of the issue is doctors. How many medical doctors and, and doctors do we have in the audience? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you had, let's just say you had a year of nutrition education in your training? Raise your hand. Six months. Oh, uh, you did have a year? Are you a naturopath? Okay, wow, good for you. So six months, three months, two months. Guess what, guy? Oh, he did have two months. Good job, Ken. So they're not getting trained in nutrition. So why the heck are they telling us, lower your fats and cholesterol? Why? How do you know anything about that? And how many registered dietitians do we have in the audience? We have one, okay. So, you know, you've been trained as well uh, in nutrition, but maybe not understand the nuances, not you specifically, but your profession. Um, the nuances of why cholesterol levels could be elevated, sometimes it goes beyond nutrition, it's lifestyle issues. That's the number nine mistake. Number 10, totally missing the role and causes of inflammation. If you don't take anything else out of this cholesterol aspect of the talk, take this away. It's inflammation that is the reason why heart disease happens. If you don't have inflammation, there is no disease. I recently had um, a key health marker, and we'll talk about it soon, but I'll go ahead and tell you mine now. It's called an HSCRP, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. It's a blood test, very easy, any doctor can run it. And it's supposed to be under 1.0 optimally. Mine came back 0.44. That's really good. And we need to keep inflammation low. Number 11, dismissing the role of blood sugar and insulin. How many people in this room Test regularly for your blood sugar levels at home. Raise your hand. I am so proud of you. The rest of you, when we're done, you're going to go down to the little chemist and you're going to get you a glucometer and you need to start testing your blood sugar because if you don't know where you stand in your blood sugar, you don't know where you stand in your health. And it's going to be very helpful, especially those of you who are newer to LCHF. If you want to find your carbohydrate tolerance level, that's a telltale sign look at your blood sugar, what's called postprandial, so it's after eating, and you wanna test it like 30, 60, 90, and 120, and it should have like a nice little curve, but if it curves up and at two hours it's still up, guess what, you ate too many carbs. So blood sugar tells the tale. Now insulin's a little bit harder to run because it can only be run in a doctor's office, but you need to know what your fasting insulin level is as well. And then the last thing we got wrong was we demonized cholesterol saying, uh, not saying why it's a good thing. You know, if you ask most people, is cholesterol good? Just ask it straight like that. Is cholesterol good? What are they going to say? Oh no, that's one of the worst things, like saturated fat. So, oh my gosh, why do they say that? Because it's been demonized again and again and again. And I'm here today to say, look, we need to tell people what's good about cholesterol. That if you didn't have cholesterol, you would die. That's powerful. Or all of the aspects that cholesterol plays. And one of the analogies I've used in interviews about cholesterol clarity was that uh, cholesterol is kind of like a firefighter. And inflammation, which we just talked about, is actually the fire. So imagine if you had a fire, your next door neighbor had a fire in their house and the firefighters didn't come, what would happen? It would you know, burn to the ground, right? So think of that analogy with cholesterol and inflammation. If you have inflammation, but then you're lowering your cholesterol because you're drinking the vegetable oils to lower your cholesterol, or you're taking a statin drug to lower your cholesterol, guess what? You've gotten rid of the firefighters. They're not there to put out the fire anymore, and your house burns down, you have some kind of cardiovascular event. Not good. All right, I hope I got through the cholesterol stuff pretty quick. So that's Cholesterol Clarity, came out last year. You can get it on Kindle. But let's talk about keto, because this has been my heart. And so when I came the last time, I talked about, I was right in the middle of my experiment with nutritional ketosis. And we've gotten some things wrong about ketosis. What was funny was I pitched this idea for, for this book, Keto Clarity, to my, uh, to my publisher first, and I said, you know, this is gonna be huge. People want to hear about ketogenic diets. Oh, it's too niche a, product, uh, too niche a subject. People won't be interested in that at all. 
I'm like, have you seen these crowds at Australia where I talked the last time? They're interested in this talk. And no. So they made me do the cholesterol one first, which I was glad because when you start talking about high fat diets, uh, you've got to get the cholesterol raises your HD, or raises, or raises your LDL and your total cholesterol, and, and that uh, the fat does that, and that then that leads to heart disease. You've got to get that out of the way first because that's going to be the first objection. In fact, several people talking to me today said, I'm afraid to eat more fat because it's going to clog my arteries. I said, please come to my talk this afternoon. <laughs> So Keto Clarity came out, it actually has done extremely well. So it's still the number one best-selling nutrition book on Amazon Australia and on Kindle. It's been out for three months. So thank you guys for, for supporting that. Thank you. So the first thing we got all wrong about ketosis, thinking it's an unhealthy, dangerous state. Anybody heard that before? Oh, it's unhealthy, it's dangerous. Well, why do they think that? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. So here's the spectrum of diabetes. 90% of the people that have diabetes are type two. 10% are type one. So let's say, and we're only talking about type one with this dangerous state. So let's say a type one diabetic who doesn't make any insulin at all. If you're type two or you're not a diabetic, you have insulin in your body and you're able to take care of the blood sugar. But let's say a type one who has no insulin eats that, and no, don't salivate over that, that does not look good, except for the meatballs maybe, and that, but then decides, you know what, I should take insulin, but I won't. Any type ones in the building? Okay, would you eat that meal and not take insulin? No, you would not, because there's some pretty bad things that would happen, and let's take a look at that. Hyperglycemia of 13 plus, that's extremely high blood sugar. Ketone levels of 20 plus, again, extremely high levels. So what happens when you have extremely high blood sugar and extremely high blood ketone levels at the exact same time? You have extremely high levels of acidosis happening in the body. And when that happens, usually the person is in a coma and they need insulin as soon as possible and probably some electrolytes and other things. But coma and death is also a possibility. But, listen to me, this cannot possibly happen in anyone who still makes even a little bit of insulin, which is most of the crowd here today. I think I saw like four type ones. But even type one diabetics who make no insulin, ketoacidosis is not dangerous. It's not gonna happen to you when you eat a low carb diet. It's only indicative of a high carb diet with no insulin and you're being stupid, right? So here's a typical meal on a ketogenic diet that would be really good. I'll let you salivate over that just for a moment. Okay. What happens? Blood sugar remains steady around four to 5.5. Blood ketone levels around one to three. And there's no presence of any kind of acidosis in the blood. So if somebody says, oh, you're on that ketogenic diet, that's so dangerous, it's unhealthy, it's gonna lead to all these acid buildup in your body. No, it does not. Number two. Getting into ketosis zaps you of energy, also known as the keto flu. So let's talk about the keto flu. It's an electrolyte imbalance in sugar to fat burning. So when you're, most of the world is a sugar burner, when you shift over to being a fat and ketone burner, um, that takes some adjustment. So during that adjustment period, you've got to know, you've got to replenish with water. You're going to lose a lot of water. And you might think, well, why? Where's the water coming from? Well, glycogen stores in your muscles have sugar, but they also have water. So you need to replenish lots of water. I should have brought a water bottle up here, by the way. Um, just kidding. Sea salt with bone broth is also really good. Um, I know Dr. Finney talks about having, um, what is it, the bouillon cubes, but I'm a big fan of doing it with real food if you can. Uh, sea salt with bone broth is a really good way to do that. And you can just salt your food in general for that matter. Potassium is a really good one as well in restoring your electrolyte balances 
as well as magnesium. So you do those things and a lot of the kind of fatigue that you feel when you first start this diet, you can ward it off with this strategy and it's certainly not a problem like they say it is. Number three, a ketogenic diet increases the risk of heart disease and we briefly just talked about this in my cholesterol clarity talk, lowers triglycerides, raises HDL, how did that get off center? Anyway, less small dense LDL particles, reduces the CRP, which we talked about, the inflammation marker, drops blood sugar and insulin levels, and blood pressure dips. By all measures, those are all heart healthy states. So why are we worried about eating that for our heart health? It's heart healthy. Number four. Simply eating low carb will put you in ketosis. How many people believed that at some point? Raise your hand. I did. We all did. We all thought, oh, just eat low carb. That's ketogenic. But one does not simply eat less carbs. So in Keto Clarity, we have this really nice acronym for keto. K is to keep carbs low, and that's, uh, that's a good starting point. I think you need to find what your low point is, and it's gonna vary from person to person. I mean, I, I was extremely metabolic resistant, insulin resistant for many years, still have to deal with that today, so my carbs are around 30 grams a day. Whereas my wife, Christine, she can have 75, 80, and do just fine with the same kind of markers that I would show. So it varies from person to person very widely. E is for eat more fat, T test ketones often, and O over doing protein is bad. So all of these things is what makes a ketogenic diet, not just the carbohydrate restriction. So let's talk about some of these other ones. Number five, neglecting the key role of moderating protein intake. How many people that bought cholesterol clarity or keto clarity, this was a new concept to you. You had never heard of moderating down on your protein. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of a newer thing, and that's been one of the gratifying things about writing that book was uh, people had not heard that before. All right, so a little biochemistry for you. You need to memorize this. And I'm just kidding. You know that's not my style. Anybody know what this is besides the medical doctors? Yes? No, it's not the Krebs cycle. Gluconeogenesis is what it is. Anybody never heard that word before? Good, we're gonna teach you what it is here. So think of it as a new way to begin making sugar in the body. So when you consume protein in excess, it gets sent to the liver and it converts it to glucose. You know what glucose is? It's sugar. So if you're trying to be a fat burner and not a sugar burner, and you're consuming too much protein, thinking that chicken breast or that kangaroo is good for you, uh-uh, like how I threw in the little Aussie uh, lean protein. So, no, it's not good for you. And, and one of the things that I had to learn was it's not so much about percentages, because people would just be like, well, just add a lot of butter or add a lot of fat to that kangaroo and it'll make it not so lean. Okay, true, but if you're extremely sensitive to carbohydrates, you're going to be sensitive to an absolute amount of protein. So you have to keep that moderated as well and that's why this big long g word is so important if you have a low tolerance level for carbohydrates you don't need to be eating a whole lot of protein now even grumpy cat knows he needs carbs but guess what he doesn't have to eat them to get them because of gluconeogenesis number six testing for the presence of ketones only in the urine. How many have used these pee sticks? Raise your hand to test for ketones. Great. Did you know they're unreliable? Good, you read my book, I know. <laughs> so let's talk about the three ketone bodies that are measured in various parts of the body. Acetoacetate is the one that is measured in the urine. It's the primary one that's in the urine. Beta-hydroxybutyrate is that fancy one that I talked about last time that I was here. And, uh, and it's the one that's measured in the blood with the, the finger prick. And then the new one that uh, Rod showed you earlier, the ketonics measures, is acetone. That's the one that's in the breath. So those are the three ketone bodies. I keep forgetting to press that. All right, so what happens to those urine ketones that makes this so reliable or unreliable? First, you see ketones present, right? And then you start to become keto-adapted, eating low-carb, high-fat over a period of time, 
I know Dr. Finney talks about it could be upwards of two to four weeks for some people. I'm thinking back to 185 kilo Jimmy Moore, probably three to four months to get fully keto adapted. And then they're converted over to blood ketones. So the acetoacetate now has become beta hydroxybutyrate. So look what happens to the urine ketones when that happens. They're gone. Now, does that happen in everybody? No, it doesn't. I never lost my urine ketones. I could still see them to kingdom come. But for some people, that acetoacetate stops spilling over in the urine and it's just in the blood. So then these people think, what have I done wrong? So they start trying to lower carbs more and they're freaking out, but they're doing something very, very right and they don't even know it. Number seven, limiting grains, fruits, and vegetables deprives you of nutrients. Anybody heard that one before? Somebody actually asked me, where do you get your nutrition from? So let's talk about that. <laughs> it ain't grains, I promise you. Let's look at grains. They contain phytic acid, preventing the absorption of key minerals like copper, magnesium, iron, zinc, and calcium. And we've only been eating them for about 10,000 years of our human existence. And it's very difficult to consume grains without lots of heavy processing. You know, I hear these dietitians talk about, well, you need to eat your healthy whole grains. I'm like, um, is there like a whole grain tree I can go grab that off of and just gnaw? No, they have to process it pretty well for you to get those grains into your diet. So are they really healthy? How about fruits and vegetables? They've got to be healthy, right? Well, they are if you eat the low starch, not uh, lean, gre uh, greasy vegetable, uh, green leafy vegetable. Wow, I am like tongue tied today. Green leafy vegetables, low sugar fruits are really the best. But what happens? According to a 2006 American Diabetes Association survey, 35% of U.S. adults and 56% of U.S. children they eat their vegetables as potatoes. Mostly fried potatoes. Gee, what could that be? Oh yeah, McDonald's French fries right and there's no nutrients in a potato as for fruit where do they go bananas bananas have 29 grams of carbohydrates in one i eat 30 a day i can have a banana and steak the rest of the day what am i doing so a ketogenic nutrition plan calls for no grains no sugars no starch Mostly whole foods like eggs, meat, nuts, high-fat dairy, non-starchy vegetables. Plenty of fat-soluble vitamins. This is why somebody asked about the vegan diet earlier. They have a tough time because they can't absorb those fat-soluble vitamins if they're eating a low-fat vegan diet. And if you consume more than just the muscle meat, organs are an incredibly nutrient-dense part of the diet as well. So people that say, well, you don't get nutrition eating LCHF, you can if you eat real food. Stay away from those stupid Atkins bars and those other like fake products. They are not doing you any good. So back at the Ancestral Health Symposium in 2012 in Harvard, there was this gentleman, Matt Lalonde. Anybody know Matt Lalonde? Oh, okay, I, I know, uh, know Daryl, I know you do. <laughs> so he, what he did was, um, he's an organic chemist, and so he did a nutrient density scale so you can see what the most nutrient dense foods are all the way to the least nutrient dense foods. So of course, the organ meats are at the top. Look all the way at the bottom. Yeah, I'm standing in the way of some of you, but processed fruit, you got can, uh, canned grains. Now the animal fats and oils, that would not apply to you guys because your meats are really high quality. In America, we have feedlot, grain fed animals, and that's what they're talking about there. Now at the very top, nuts and seeds, fish and seafood, pork, beef, eggs, vegetables. Hmm, that sounds awful lot like LCHF, doesn't it? Number eight thing we got wrong about ketosis, and this is a controversial one. Eating low carb, high fat leads to hypothyroidism. Anybody heard that one before? So here's the truth. None of the medical practitioners I've ever talked to in uh, preparation for my books or on my podcast have ever seen this as a common problem from eating a ketogenic diet. And lower thyroid numbers aren't necessarily a lower function. In Keto Clarity, one of my experts was Dr. Ron Rosedale, and he says that these lower thyroid numbers may mean better function. 
So it's very easy to undereat. Anybody uh, seen that eating ketogenic that you forget to eat? When I first started doing my uh, experiment, I did. I forgot to eat uh, doing the nutritional ketosis, and that's kind of freaky, you know, forgetting to eat. But when you do that, you end up in a hypocaloric state, and that can lower the downregulation of the T3 conversion. And who's to say the normal lab levels that we see are actually normal? Who's to say that the people that eat LCHF ketogenic we're the normal ones and everybody else is hyper thyroid, right? We don't know because nobody's ever looked at ketogenic population. The fact is the thyroid doesn't have to work as hard when it's fueled by ketones. And despite these lower numbers, ketogenic dieters are generally asymptomatic of any kind of hypothyroidism. And by the way, you don't have to eat any kind of safe starches because carbohydrates really aren't essential. Anybody know why? I said the big long G word earlier. That's why. Even people who consume a high carb diet actually can suffer from hypothyroidism. So if it's a carb issue, why is that happening? And most of these, uh, about 80% of hypothyroidism is autoimmune related. And most autoimmune issues are made worse by consuming starchy foods. And there was a January 2014 BBC news story that found European, European hunter-gatherers 7,000 years ago were unable to digest starch. So if it's such an essential part of your diet to make your thyroid healthy, why is that happening? Number nine, your brain needs glucose to function well. Anybody heard that one before? Yeah. So let's look at what those nosy dietitians have to say. That won't be you in 30 years, I promise. So you need to consume 130 grams of carbohydrate daily for minimal brain function. This is to ensure that your brain gets an adequate amount of glucose to operate. Anybody ever heard that lecture before? It's the assumption is that the brain can only function on glucose as a fuel source, but your brain loves running on ketones as the primary fuel. So what happens to the brain in ketosis? Let's look at that. Stabilized mood, decreased anxiety, mental sharpness, feelings of happiness and general sense of well-being. Anybody in a ketogenic state can attest to all this? Can I get a hallelujah? Woo <laughs> Number 10, a ketogenic diet cuts calories for weight loss. And it's so funny, this one is the most hilarious one because they say it like it's something bad. So riddle me this, Batman. We have powerful appetite suppressant drugs, right? Some of the most powerful drugs in the world to suppress people's appetite so they don't eat as much. But guess what? We also have powerful appetite suppressant foods. Now that looks good. We're gonna like linger on that one for a little bit. Okay. So why do we think that is healthier than that? Because there's money to be made from that and not that. And so, you know, all these excuses that people say it cuts calories for weight loss, well, yeah, that's what these drugs do, but we're doing it without a drug, with an all-natural, real food. Why is this worse? Cutting calories naturally rather than with a drug seems to me to be a better option. Number 11, our ancestors didn't live in a constant state of ketosis. So what did our early ancestors eat? They had fish, they had meats, they had eggs, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, but what else did they have? Hmm, what else did they have? Oh yeah, they had that, right? And those ketones were what sustained them between the big kills. And even after the big kill, when they were eating, you know, mostly the, the, the meat and the fat from the big kill, they were still in ketosis. And so that's what kept them sustained. In Keto Clarity, another one of my experts, Dr. Bill Wilson, he said, humans used both glucose 
and ketone bodies for energy, and during those periods of food shortage or after a big animal kill, guess what sustained the early ancestors? Hmm. Oh yeah, ketones. So here are a few more final thoughts from Dr. Bill Wilson. Our ancestors spent most of their time in a state of ketosis. If our early ancestors had not developed a way to use ketones for energy, our species would have ended up on Darwin's shortlist eons ago. And that's true. So here's a people group that could be described as probably the first ketogenic people group, the Inuit Eskimos. So let's take a look at their environment. It was an Arctic environment. Can you grow vegetation in an Arctic environment? No. So by default, you have to eat very low carb, very high fat in those environments. And I, I know they had a lot of, uh, what was it, seal blubber and whale blubber. That was their sources of fat. And yet they were energetic, full of stamina, and they got keto adapted before they even knew what keto adapted was. The last one is number 12, athletes, which we've heard from a couple here today, cannot perform well while in a ketogenic state. <laughs> so we load up on the carbs. What else is the other part that we're supposed to do? Oh, oh yeah. No, don't look like those athletes. Why are fat and ketones, uh, why do they fuel exercise better? Let's take a look at that. Ben Greenfield was another one of my experts. Anybody know Ben? Or you know him online. <laughs> he was one of my experts in Keto Clarity. He's a, a triathlete, and he said there's three really great reasons why fat and ketones fuel your body better when you're exercising. You have metabolic superiority of fat for fuel. Did you know that when you are a sugar burner, you have about 2,000 calories worth of energy to expend, but when you're a fat and ketone burner, that jumps to 40,000 calories worth of energy. Pretty powerful, 20 times more. And that's of a lean person. Number two, mental enhancement of ketones, like we were talking about with the brain health benefits, you have such brain health control on this diet. And that's very key when you're in the midst of uh, competition and, and exercise. And then the last one is greater health and longevity from controlling your blood sugar while going keto because as your blood ketones go up, your blood sugar will come down and those are both great markers that you're doing well. So ketones are actually the preferred fuel source for the muscles, heart, liver, and brain. None of these vital organs handle carbohydrates very well and thus can become damaged by excessive consumption. Athletes can, can consume more carbs and protein than non-athletes, but that doesn't mean they need a carb up before a race like has been often put out there. So what you want to do is find the right mix of macronutrients to improve performance in the long duration and exercise itself actually will raise your ketone levels. Now, here's one thing if you are going to exercise, don't test your blood sugar or your blood ketones right after getting done exercise. You want to know why? Your blood sugar is going to be up and your blood ketones might be a little bit down. So wait a couple of hours, relax a little bit and then test and you'll see accurate numbers. And then lower inflammation from the ketogenic diet enables quicker recovery time. And the ketone bodies are now being referred to in athletic circles as a super fuel. So that's Keto Clarity, and thank you very much.